to him, we need to understand who he is and we need to understand the, the whole court system. So um, Fiona is online. Fiona, you say that in in the earthly court system we have in front, we've got we've got somebody who is normally in front in the court. It's the judge. It's the judge. So so guys, take a piece of paper and then you write down um, on your piece of paper, you write down judge. But but try try and draw the court system. So the judge is in front and then you've got the rest of the people in the court. So at the top, you write judge. And then who, who appears before the judge? Did you say the advocator? Yeah, the advocate. So if mm. if you are accused, Fiona, mm. if you're yes. accused of murder or or any other um, sin or, or law breaking that there is, then you go to a lawyer and then the lawyer will help you. And eventually the lawyer will get the help of an advocate yeah. Because an advocate is qualified to represent you in the court. Right. Mm -hmm. So on the one side of your paper, write down advocate. Okay. And then on the other side of the paper, who's who's the person that will accuse you of the your um, law breaking in the court system? The prosecutor. The prosecutor. And the prosecutor does what? He accuses you. So the prosecutor is also called the accuser mm -hmm. and the advocate is called the defender. Do yes. you agree? Okay. Yes. So write down on a piece of paper. I'm going to show you what I've done here. So you write down at the top, you write judge. And on the one side, you write advocate or defender. And on the other side, you write down accuser or the prosecutor. And now where are you? Are you with the prosecutor? If you go to court or are you with the advocate? I'm with the advocate. Okay. Now I want you to go to 1 John. Go to the first book of John. 1 John chapter 2 verse 1. 1 John. 1 John chapter 2 verse 1. And then you read it for me. Chapter, chapter 2, verse 1. Yes. My dear children, I write this so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with our Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. Wow. So in this court system, who is the advocate of the heavenly courts? Jesus. Yeshua. Yeshua, yes. the Messiah. Okay. Yes. So remember now, you are the human being that is accused of sinning. And the Bible says the wages of sin is death. So you yes. are coming to the judge. The judge is going to, um, um, what is the word now? He's going to bring you the death sentence because we deserve death. Mm. But now we come before the judge and we have an advocate. The Bible says that is Yeshua. He is the advocate. Okay, so, so who's the judge? That's good. Okay, go to um, Isaiah. Go to the prophet Isaiah. Mm. Chapter 33. Isaiah 33. Isaiah chapter 33 verse 22. It says... 322 mm -hmm. for the Lord is our judge the Lord is our lawgiver the Lord is our king he will save us what? so there's many more verses but all the verses agree that God is the final judge and mm. God is also the one who gave the law you know if there's a law in your country that you have to um what laws do you have in Uganda? Give me just an easy law, one of your easy laws. Mm -hmm. um, the laws. <laughs> if, you break, if you break such a law, then you're going to go to prison. Theft. Theft. So you, you may not steal. So your country has a government and a president 
and that president um, made the law that you guys cannot steal. Yeah. And if you are caught stealing, then you're going to go to prison. prison. But yeah. before you go to prison, you come before the judge. So the Bible says this judge is also the one that actually wrote the laws. Now we know mm -hmm. that God is the lawgiver. He's the one who wrote the laws. He wrote the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not steal. So if you're being caught um, stealing or blaspheming or breaking any of God's commandments, you are guilty and you're going to get the death penalty. You're not going to be able to go to the kingdom of God. You're going to be destroyed in the, in the judgment fire. But now the Bible also says, before we are sentenced to death, we, can, we actually have a chance to repent and to come right again. So then we need an advocate because we can't approach God on our own. We need an advocate. So the Bible says God's the judge, Yeshua's the advocate. Now, who is the prosecutor? Who is the prosecutor? Satan. Yeah, let's see if we can find it's a verse for that. Devil. So the devil is um, the prosecutor, but in the Bible is actually called the accuser. Because mm. the prosecutor is the one that will accuse you of your sin. And then the advocate is the one that will defend you before the judge of your sin. So go to Revelation 12. Revelation chapter. Revelation chapter twelve, mm -hmm. verse nine and ten. And the great dragon was cast out, that that old serpent called the devil, and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his and 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 his and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ of, of his Christ, for the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. Wow. So you see, verse nine says the dragon who's also called the what? The old serpent. Where's the old serpent in the Bible? The Sorry? serpent of old. Where, where do we read about the serpent of old days, old times? I think in Daniel. Even before that, it says old, old times, very long, long time ago. Where do we read about the serpent? In Genesis. In Genesis, the beginning of the Bible, the beginning of time. So yeah. the serpent in the tree of knowledge of good and evil is the dragon. Look at verse 9. The great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan. So the serpent in the tree of knowledge of good and evil is the dragon. He is the devil. He is Satan. And when Yeshua comes back, then this whole dragon serpent system will be cast down. But look at what he's called in verse 10. He's called the accuser of the brethren. And what does the accuser do day and night at the end of verse 10? What does this dragon, this serpent do day and night? For the accuser of the brethren is who is killed before God and the Okay. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. So what does the accuser do day and night? He accuses us. He accuses us. So the, the prosecutor or the accuser is the devil. He is on the one side. Just like you explained this morning when you were doing Bible study, you've got the voice of the accuser and he never shuts up. You see yeah. that? He accuses day us day and night. He never shuts up. He's in front of God day and night, thinking and, and, and working and, and um, trying to get stuff 
to accuse us of before God. And if we keep quiet, if we don't spend time with God, if we don't spend time in prayer, then the accuser's voice is heard day and night before God. And our voices are never heard before God. So that's what you preached this morning, Fiona, was very important. And I hope the people, the people understood what you were saying, because our voices needs to be heard before God. Mm -hmm. And we have an advocate. We have Yeshua, the Messiah. Now, in a normal court system, can let's say you let's say you committed murder, Fiona. Yeah. Let's say you killed somebody, and you are now being brought before the judge. Can the judge just set you free if you say sorry? They can't. They can't because you committed a murder. You broke yeah. the law that says you may not murder. And if the judge just says, ah, Tuma, it's fine. You, you said you're sorry, so it's okay. I'm going to forgive you. You can just go home. Do you think the family of the person that you killed, do you think they will think that this judge is fair? No. Do you think that God is a fair judge? He is. Yes, he's a fair judge. So can he just forgive our sins? So am I just like that? No. He can't. Because the wages of sin is death. If you yeah. transgress the laws of God, you will have the, um, the death penalty on you. So now we come before the judge. Um, the only thing we can do is we can admit our guilt. Because what is the accuser doing? Here on, let's say this side is the accuser. This side is the advocate. And in front of us is the judge. Now, here we're standing. Now the, now the accuser or the prosecutor, he is saying to the judge, God, that person committed a sin. You need to give that person to me. That person belongs to me in my kingdom because he sinned against you. Is there anything that the devil said that's not true? No, everything is true. You see, the accuser is not stupid. He's going to mm. use actual sin in your life that you have to bring before the judge to accuse you of. Now, you can't deny the sin because the, the devil will, will not bring false witness against you. He will bring actual witness against you. He will call all his witnesses in the heavenly court and he will tell the judge, this person deserves to die. You can't deny that. You can't say that he's lying. You can't do anything. Because you're guilty. What is the thing that you can do? Repent. Yes. Now, let's go. 1 John 1 verse 9. Go to the first book of John. 1 John 1 verse 9. 1 John 1 verse 9. If we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So standing in front of a judge, it will be very stupid to try and deny that we have sin. It is the Bible gives us the steps. It will be easier to just confess it. You know, whatever the accuser has against you, because sometimes the accuser can even say that you've got hidden sin inside of you that you don't even know about. Mm -hmm. Or as you learn the, the Genesis Bible studies with two trees, you learn about the laws of God in this world that we are not, we didn't even know about all his laws. And sometimes we've broken a lot of his laws. So all those sins are coming up against us. It's written against us in the prosecutor's um, list. So he's coming before the judge and he says, yeah, but that person transgressed law number one, law number two, law number three. And as you learn about your sin, as you do your Bible studies and you learn about everything that is against the, the will of God, the first thing you do is you repent of it. Now, what is repentance? How do you understand repentance? Repentance. Mm. If you, if God brings something to your mind, that is a mm. sin in your life. 
What will you do in repentance? First of all, I, uh, I accept I did wrong. You, you, you admit that you did wrong. Yes. So, so the first thing, write it down. Yeah, because now it's you and the advocate. You, 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 you have to tell the advocate exactly what you've done wrong because the advocate must represent you before the judge. So mm -hmm. your first step is to admit. Right, that's step number one. Mm -hmm. So write down admit. So the, um, you might be doing your Bible study and maybe, maybe uh, let's, let's use a simple, uh, a simple example. Maybe when you were very young, you stole something from a friend of yours. Now you've forgotten about that. And even your mm -hmm. friend might even have forgotten about it. But it's still a law of God that you have transgressed. So it's still written, right? Yeah. It's written on your charge sheet. That's a, that's a good, let's write that down under the word of um, the accuser. The accuser has a charge sheet. Let's write that down, charge sheet. So on your charge sheet, you actually have the sin of theft. Maybe it was mm -hmm. just something small you stole a long time ago, but you forgot about it. So the first thing, the moment the, the Holy Spirit convict you of a sin that you've done, even if you have long time forgotten about it. The first thing you do is you admit. So mm. when you admit, you the Bible says, if we confess our sins, um, that means you have to confess. Um, and I think there's a verse, I think it's in Romans. Romans 10 verse 9. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt and shall believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So see, confession is not just in your head. You have yes. to speak it with your mouth, exactly like you preached this morning. Your voice must be heard in the court. You see that? Yes. But yes. then you must believe in your heart as well. Now, to believe something is not just to say, Oh, I believe, I believe, I believe. To really believe that Yeshua is the Son of God, to believe that he's the Word of God, to, to believe that he's the advocate that can stand in for you in the court, you must believe with your heart that it must be a conviction in your heart, but you must also live it out. So whatever you believe must be seen in your life as well. You can't just say that you believe and then you live differently. So if you believe that he's your advocate, then you walk every day in um, following his words because he's the one that tells you what to do, how to do it, what not to do. Your advocate will tell you, I, I will represent you in court, but you must stop stealing. Once I've represented you in court and you go back to your normal life, you cannot steal ever again. You must stop stealing now. So we have to believe not only with our heart, but with our lives. There must be a change in our lives. And that's only by studying the words of our God. And Yeshua is the word of God that became flesh. So we study all the laws of God. We confess all the laws that we've broken. And we, we ask our advocate, the word of God that became flesh, to change us. So that we can really, our whole heart, our whole mind, and all our strength, that means everything we do on a daily basis, now becomes changed into this new lifestyle we have. So we confess with our mouth, we believe in our heart, and that is our repentance. We admit our guilt. So I admit that I've done this wrong. After, you have, after you've admitted, you've 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 admitted that what the accuser is accusing you of is true. What is the next step? You repent. You repent. Write down number two is repent. So we saw now in 1 John 1 verse 9, if we repent of our sins, then he can forgive us. He cannot forgive us if we don't repent. 
And also we've, we've seen now that we have to repent with our mouths. We, we cannot have one prayer that says, uh, please God, forgive me all my sin. Amen. Does that mean he's forgiven us everything? No. No. We have to go through a process of being made holy before God. And the charge sheet that Satan has against us is not just going to be scrapped when you say one prayer. You have to confess every sin as you start to learn about what sin is and what the will of God is. You actually start understanding everything in your own life and in your family's life, in your culture's life, and in your nation's life. You start learning about everything that might be on your chart sheet. And then the Holy Spirit will help you to work through that. Even if it takes months, sometimes it can take years. It doesn't matter. Every time you study the Bible, and you learn something new, then you confess it. It might even be something that happened in your, your mother or your father or your grandfather's life. It's fine. It doesn't matter. Look at how beautiful. Um, I want to find that scripture. I think it's in Daniel. Let's, let's look at Daniel 9. Read for me from verse 3. Um, let's just read up to... Verse 11, Daniel 9, verse 3 to 11. Okay. And I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplications with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed and I prayed unto the Lord my God and made my confession and said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant mercy and mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandment. We have sinned and are committed iniquity and have done wickedly and have rebelled even by departing from thy precepts and from thy judgments. Neither have we hearkened unto thy servants, the prophets, which spake into thy name to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, and to all the people of the land. O Lord, righteousness belongeth unto thee, but unto us confusion of faces, as that this day is that is at this day to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and unto all Israel that are near and there are and that are far off through all the countries whither thou hast driven them because of their trespass that they have trespassed against thee. Eight O Lord, to us belongeth confusion of faith to our kings, to our princes, and to our fathers, because we have sinned against thee. To the Lord our God belong mercies and forgiveness, though we have rebelled against him. Neither have we obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his laws, which he set before us by his servants, the prophets. Yeah, all Israel have transgressed thy law, even by departing that they might not obey thy voice. Therefore the curse is, power, is poured upon us, and the oath that is written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, because we have sinned against him. Yeah. You see now, hello Audrey, hope you are well. So you see now, Fiona, that how Daniel is confessing. He's confessing not only his own sin, but he goes even so far as to confess the whole nation's sin. He even mm -hmm. goes so far as to confess the sin of the kings, the princes, and even his fathers. Because all of that is on the charge sheet of the accuser. So True. I've learned from this um, confession of Daniel, I've learned to pray. Whatever sin I've done whatever sin my fathers have done. As I study the word, you get to know each and every law of God and each and every sin, transgression of God's law. And then you start confessing. And eventually when you've, you've gone through 
all the confessions for both you, your family, your country, your nation, even for other brothers and sisters that believes together with you in other countries. You start learning how to stand in the court system. And you start learning how to pray for for more than just yourself. So confession is a really fantastic process that God actually wants all of us to go through so that we can we, we learn how to stand in for other people as well. This is why it's such a great thing to really um, look for stuff that you can confess about. Even if you if you think something bad about someone, the moment you catch yourself thinking something bad, Yeshua says, even if you think about, um, if you hate your brother in your heart, you have committed murder. Yeshua comes and he takes the law of God and he says, if you don't murder somebody with your hands, but you murder them in your heart. You've still transgressed the law. The moment you catch yourself doing that, to confess it quickly, the quicker we confess our sins, the quicker it can come off the charge sheet of the accuser. So step number one was admit your sin. Step number two was repent of your sin. What is step number three? Because now you're standing in court, ne? There's the judge, yes, your advocate, and yes, um, the accuser. So now you've admitted your guilt. The accuser cannot um, continue screaming in the court system because you've admitted your guilt. Now you've repented of your guilt. You said, I'm sorry. I know I've done wrong. I know this is against your law. I am sorry that I've done it. What is now the next thing that you're going to say? I don't know. So let's let me let me get you to think about this. If if you have said something bad about me, me and yes. if you had to talk to me, and if, if I said to you, Fiona, have have you said something bad about me? Then your first thing will be to admit. You will say, Yes, Marda, I said something bad about you. Your second thing will be. I'm sorry that I said something bad about you. What will the third thing be that you will say to me? Or maybe you want to ask me. Oh, I'll ask for forgiveness. Yes, exactly. So number three is to ask for mercy. Write it down. Number one is admit. Number two is repent. Number three is ask for mercy. Okay, what is mercy? Remember what we said, if you killed somebody and you are taken to court and you say to the judge, I'm sorry, I admit that I've killed someone. I'm sorry that I killed somebody. Can he just set you free? Mm. Sorry? Can the judge if, if you admit it in, the, in a court of law, let's say you, you committed murder um, and you admit that you commit murder and you say that you're sorry that you committed the murder, can the judge let you go free? You pay for the penalty. You, you're going you're gonna to pay the penalty. You can't go for free. So, yes. so let's say the death penalty was, I'm not sure, is the death penalty in Uganda? Do you have the death no, penalty? It, it, it was removed. Yeah, yeah. Even in South Africa, the death penalty was removed. But let's imagine for a second, the death penalty is still in place. So if you are caught murdering somebody and you come to court and you admit your, your guilt, you repent and you say that you're sorry, then you have to carry the penalty of your sin. And that's the death penalty. The judge cannot just give you mercy. On what grounds? Why will the judge give you mercy? He can't. Because you, you, you have transgressed the law. You have murdered somebody. You have to receive the death penalty or go to prison. There's nothing the judge can do. 
right. In in a in an earthly judge system, in an earthly court system, he can't just set you free. Am I right? Yes. Yeah. You're right. The only thing that can happen is you have to pay with your life. You have to um, receive the death penalty. And now this is where the advocate comes in. Let's go back to that verse, 1 John 2 verse 1. Let's go back to the advocate. The first book of John, 1 John 1. Sorry, 1 John chapter 2 verse 1. Let's go back my, to that. Yeah, my my little children, the things write I unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with our Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. So, the judge doesn't want us to sin. The advocate doesn't want us to sin. But if we have sinned. We can come before the judge, John says, because we have an advocate. So what did this advocate do so that our sins can be forgiven? He bleeds on our, be on our behalf. He bleeds on our behalf. How did he bleed? What had to, what had to happen with him? He gave his, he, he, he gave his crucified. life. He yes. was crucified. He died. So, yes. because Romans 6 verse 23 says the, the penalty of sin is death. death. So, when we stand before the judge, we deserve death because of mm. all our transgressions of his law. So, now, that's why Yeshua couldn't just say, don't worry, your sins are forgiven. He died. So, when we stand before the judge, remember now, the accuser also knows that the penalty of sin is death. So what does the accuser want? He wants death. He wants you to die. He wants you to go to hell. So now we, we don't stand before the judge alone. We say to the judge, I admit my guilt. I repent of my guilt. I'm sorry about my guilt. I, I deserve the death penalty. And then you step back. Because now it's the time of your advocate. So now you turn to the advocate and you say, Yeshua, you are my advocate. I believe in you. That's why 1 John 1 verse, no, Romans 10 verse 1 said, if we, if we confess Yeshua with our mouth and we believe in our hearts, we shall be saved. So now we turn to the advocate and we say, Yeshua, I confess that you are the son of God, that you died on the cross for my sins and that you are the word of God that became flesh. I appoint you as my advocate. Please, will you be my advocate? And then you step back and him, the advocate who died in your place, who took the death penalty in your place, he then stands forward and he stands before the judge. And now, what does the judge see? Because you deserve the death penalty. The accuser also knows that you deserve the death penalty. He wants to see your blood. But whose blood does he see? Jesus is. He see the advocate's blood. So the yes. advocate comes before the judge and he says, Yes, yes. you've heard the confession of my child. She admitted she doesn't lie. She doesn't hide her sin. She doesn't try to run away from her sin. She confessed her sin, but she also confesses that she believes in me. And the judge have appointed me to be the advocate of humanity. And then the advocate can say to the judge, here's the blood. The blood that was spilled in death. This blood is upon my child. On, on this one that has confessed her sin. And once he puts his blood over you, then your sin is covered by his blood. And now when the judge looks at you, he sees the blood that covers your sin. And now only can he set you free. He could never set you free before because the penalty of sin is death. Somebody 
has to die. And that is why Yeshua had to die. And now if you confessed the sin of murder, let's say you you um, committed genuine murder, um, you murdered somebody that um, was your neighbor or whatever. If you confess that sin in an earthly court, maybe the judge can be lenient. He's still going to send you to prison or he's going to pronounce the death penalty over you. But now the, um, the accuser, Satan, can no longer use this against you in the heavenly courts. Because in the heavenly courts, that, that sin that you have transgressed is now covered by the blood of Messiah. And yet I want to show you, you remember we talked about the charge sheet, the charge sheet of all your sins that the devil has written, all the sins that you have transgressed against God. What happens to that charge sheet when your sin is now covered by the blood of Messiah? Do you know, Fiona? Sorry, what, what, what happens? Um, the charge sheet, remember we talked about the... I don't hear oh, yeah, you. you're still there. Oh, there we go. Uh, we've got load shedding. Our electricity just went off. Um, so, so the last thing we said is that the, the judge can only forgive you once Yeshua, your advocate, stands in your place in the court and he takes your sin upon himself and he covers you with his blood. But my question is now, remember the accuser, Satan, He's got a charge sheet against you with all your sin. What happens to the charge sheet? It's, it, it, it becomes blank. All the sins I it becomes are... blank. Yo, yeah, how, how, how does it become blank? After the, after, after the blood of Jesus has covered them. After the judge has looked at the blood of the advocate who is defending you, who gave um um remember it was supposed to be uh, remember the um, the um, the 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 when when you sin you're supposed to die but mm -hmm. because of the, because of the blood of Jesus. That the judge that, that the judge looks at because he, because the pain out of death it was Jesus Jesus removed it for all the humanity, so when you repent and the judge and the judge looks at the blood, the prosecutor's church 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 sheet becomes blank because of yes. the blood. Yes, you know you know what happens um, if I look at the Bible. The moment that you appoint Yeshua as your advocate and he stands in front of you before the judge, he actually turns to the accuser. Yeshua actually turns to the accuser and he takes the charge sheet from him. Let me show you. Go to the book of Colossians. Turn for me to Colossians chapter 2. Tell me when you're there. Okay, Colossians chapter 2, read for us verse 13 and 14. And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out all the unwriting of ordinances that was against you which was contrary to us and took it out of the way nailing it to his cross read that last verse again slowly tell me what you understand about the charge sheet or the handwriting of the the, the list of your sin read that last verse slowly blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us 
which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Can you see what Yeshua does, this advocate, the one that was nailed to the cross in our place? He can, he can actually now turn around to the accuser and he takes that handwriting, the, the charge sheet, your list of sins that you've confessed. Remember, we, we have to confess every sin. So it might be that you're only confessing some sins. The charge sheet of the sins you've confessed the advocate can take it away from the accuser and he can actually never use it against you again. That's amazing. And he blots it out. Like you say, the charge sheet becomes blank. Yeshua actually, with his blood, he, he erases, he takes away those sins that's written down on that charge sheet. And the only way he could do that was to nail it to the cross. Who was nailed to the cross? Yeshua was nailed to the cross. So it means Yeshua took all your sins actually onto himself. And then he was nailed to the cross. So that's why when you've confessed the sin, when you understand that you've transgressed the will of God in your life, you admit it, you confess it, you ask forgiveness for it, and it's then covered by the blood. It's because Yeshua took it in himself. And if Satan ever tries to accuse you of those sins again, you can say, no, look there, it's upon the cross. It's been nailed to the cross. We've, we've heard, I don't know, in your church, Fiona, or Audrey, or Shana, or Paul, any one of you, have you ever heard the thing in church that was said where they say the law was nailed to the cross? Who of you have heard that in church before? where they said the law was nailed to the cross. Yes. You've heard that, name. Yes. There's, there's not a verse in the Bible that says the law was nailed to the cross. It yes. talks about our sins, the charge sheet of our sins, the, curse, the curses that came upon us because of disobedience was nailed to the cross. So looking at Colossians 2, verse 14, he talks about the handwriting of, ordina of ordinances that was against us. So, so there exists a list, a handwritten list of ordinances that is against us. Now, the moment that something is against you, it's like the accuser or the prosecutor in the heavenly courts. He's against us. He's bringing accusations against us so all the accusations of our sin that he brings against us is written down on a list this handwriting of ordinances that is against us but it's, it's not a good thing to have it's not a good thing to have this list of handwriting against us let's look at this list of handwriting can anybody read for me um in the old testament the book of numbers Let's go to Numbers. Numbers chapter 5. Are you there? Verse 23. Numbers chapter 5, verse 23. And, and the priest. Someone is ready. Mm. No, it's fine, Fiona. You can read. Okay. And and the priest shall write these curses in the book, and he shall blot them out with the bitter water. So the first sentence of this verse is, the priest shall write the curses in a book. Do you see how it's the same as what we've just spoken about the whole time? The accuser, he actually has a book wherein is written all your accusations, all your sin and all the curses of the sin. So here in the Old Testament, in the law of God, because the book of Numbers is written by Moses, ne? just like Daniel, remember when Daniel prayed, he said, we have transgressed all your laws that you gave to your servant Moses. So here in the book of Numbers, we are learning about the unfaithful wife. 
if a wife is unfaithful, the husband will bring her to the priest and the priest shall write the curses of the unfaithful woman. He shall write them in a book. But if the woman wasn't unfaithful, then there's actually bitter water. You need to read the whole um, chapter numbers five to understand that. But then there's actually bitter water that the priest mixes. And then this woman must drink the bitter water. And if she was indeed um, unfaithful to her husband, if she was whoring around, then she will die when she drinks the bitter water. But if she's um, um, innocent, then when she drinks the bitter water, then she doesn't die. But then something happens to the handwriting, um, to the curses that the priest wrote in the book. The bitter water will blot them out. Do you see that? So the curses or the sin or the penalty of our sins that's written down can only be blotted out by the bitter water. Can somebody tell me what did Yeshua pray in the garden of Gethsemane? What did he ask God to do? Can anybody remember? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, Jesus was praying if the cup of suffering would be removed. Yes, Paul. But um, the, the other translation says the bitter cup. Nee. Yeah. If yeah. it's possible, let the bitter cup pass from me. What bitter <laughs> cup was Yeshua talking about? Do you know? Remember now, we just read Numbers 5. What, what did we read about in Numbers 5? The, the bitter water. The bitter water of the whoring wife. We are the bride of Messiah, right? But the yeah. bride of Messiah, when she commits sin, then she's, a, she's like a whore. She becomes a prostitute. And mm -hmm. then the accuser, remember, we now have this whole legal system we've got the judge we've got the advocate and we've got the accuser so now the accuser he wants the whore to burn with him in the judgment fire he wants to steal the bride of god away from him so he stands before the judge and he says your bride has committed sin she deserved death you start learning about all the sins that um, God says when you do this it's called sin when you learn about it you first admit your guilt then you repent of your guilt and then you ask for mercy once you ask for mercy your advocate Yeshua then stands in front of you before the judge and then he takes he, he in your place he drinks the bitter cup of the whoring wife in your place and then he can take the charge sheet, your handwriting of curses. He can take it from the accuser and he can wash it. And now, now you understand what it means that we stand before God and we are no longer ashamed because the charge sheet is clean. We have been washed clean by the blood of the advocate, Messiah Yeshua. And that's what it means for the bride to wash her clothes clean and to have white garments to wear. You can only wash your garments clean through a lifestyle of repentance. Fiona, does that make sense? Because what you preached this morning when you told your, your group that our voices must be heard because if our voices is not heard in the courtroom, then the accuser's voice is heard the whole time. What do you think now? Do you understand the whole um, court system better? Yeah, I've heard better. And um, there was the, you said the accuser, he wants us to go to, to death with him into the burning fire. And um, 
this scripture came into my mind, John 10, 10, where he says, he comes not to, but to steal, destroy, and kill. Very true, very true. That's all the accuser wants to do. Remember, yeah. we, we saw in, um, where was that now? I think it was in the book of Revelation, Revelation 12, verse 9 and 10. We saw that um, the dragon, who is the serpent of the book of Genesis, he's called the devil, he's called Satan, and he's called the accuser of the brethren. We saw that in Revelation 12. Because what did the serpent do from the beginning? Um, in, in, uh, in Genesis chapter 3, he told a lie to us as God's people. He told us it will be okay. We can transgress the commandment of God. Adam and Eve said, God said we can't eat from the tree of knowledge. And the serpent said, it's fine. Don't worry about it. You can. You can eat from the tree of knowledge. So he was lying to humanity by telling them, don't worry to be obedient to God. It's fine. You can be disobedient to him. What was the result of that? The moment Adam and Eve became disobedient to God and they ate the fruit, what was the first thing that happened to them? What was the first thing that they saw that happened to them? They were naked. They were naked. That's the first thing they saw. And then what did they do when they were naked? They hid. Why? Why do you hide away when you are naked? Because of shame. Because of shame. Because now you've got no, you've got no clothes. Imagine if I was sitting here with no clothes on. It would be horrible. I would be hiding away because it's a shameful thing for us to be naked. That's why the Bible says when we stand in our sin, we stand naked before the judge of all the earth. How are you going to feel if you go to court and you look at yourself and you say, oh, I'm naked. And here's the whole courtroom and the judge and the advocate and the accuser. And they're all looking at you and you are naked. How will you feel? I'll be ashamed. You'll be ashamed. Um, I want to take you now to the book of Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah. Because we are standing naked. Because we listened to the serpent. We allowed him to deceive us. And, and as we start learning from two trees in the garden and from your own Bible studies, you are learning that we need to be obedient to God. You now start realizing how naked you are. And then you confess your sin before the judge. You ask the advocate to stand in your place. And then you repent of your sin. The blood covers you. But the moment the blood covers you, it actually means the blood clothes you. Did you know that? The moment the blood comes upon you and your sin is covered by the blood, it's like you are getting dressed. It's like you are getting clothed. And your nakedness, your shame is covered by Yeshua. Yeshua becomes your clothing. He becomes your robe. He becomes your, your covering, covering your shame before the judge. That's why the, the Bible talks about Yeshua is our robe of righteousness. Please, all of you, let's go to Isaiah chapter 61, verse 10. Please, Fiona. It says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom, that is himself if with ornaments, and as... Oh, sorry. 
Let me come again. And has covered with me with robe of righteousness, has a bedroom that is himself with ornaments, and has a bride and donors herself with the hard jewels. Can you see how the God of the Old Testament, he has always used this um, picture that we got from Genesis 3. The moment we sin against God, we become naked. But then we repent before God. We admit our guilt. We admit our sin. We say to God, we know your law says this. We have broken your law. We have handwriting that is against us now. We repent of that. We go through the whole repentance process. And Yeshua um, covers our, our sins. Yeshua in in Hebrew, the name Yeshua, it means salvation. Look at this verse, Isaiah 61 verse 10. Chris, that you just read. I will greatly rejoice in Yahuwah. I will be so glad in my God. Why? Because remember, we've sinned now. We're standing in court. Yes, the judge. The judge is going to pronounce the death penalty on us. But now we have our advocate. Yeshua, and he covers our sin with his blood so that the accuser, the devil, the serpent cannot take us with him into death. Now we are glad. Of course, I mean, our lives are saved. So Isaiah teaches us what to do next, because step number one, if you're in a court, is that you must admit your guilt. Step number two, you repent of your guilt. Step number three, you ask for forgiveness. Then the advocate will come and cover your sins with his blood. Now, what is step number four? We must be grateful. We must say, thank you, judge. That is step number four. Fiona, I think you're the only one that's been with us from the beginning. You write down step number four. We say, thank you. That is step number four. My soul rejoices in God. Why? Chris, read for us again. Why does my soul rejoice? Because remember, I was standing naked before the judge. So my soul rejoices. Why? Isaiah 61 verse 10. Anybody? It says, I'll greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul be joyful in my God, for he has closed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with a robe of righteousness, has a bridegroom that is himself with ornaments, and has a bride donates herself with jewels. So, my rejoices greatly because of because of what what has he done he has clothed us with garments of righteousness salvation. salvation the first one is salvation oh, yeah. what is salvation in hebrew what is salvation yeshua. in hebrew yeshua. yeshua can you see how yeshua is not just in the new testament he has clothed us with garments of Yeshua. And he has wrapped us. He has wrapped us with a robe of righteousness. What is righteousness? Because remember now, we were accused by the accuser, by the devil, of all our sins. We were standing before the judge. We got forgiveness before the judge. And our shame was covered by Yeshua. Now it says he wraps us in a robe of righteousness. Who can tell me what is righteousness? Being morally or just fight with God. I think. Mm, just, just say again for me, Fiona, what is righteousness? I think being more morally right or right with God. 
after, to be after right, you have remained. To be right with God. Yes. yes. Righteousness is to do the right thing before God. Up to now, we've done the wrong thing before God because we didn't understand his law. Now that we understand what sin is and we repent of our sin and we get forgiveness of our sins, we are clothed with the garments of Yeshua and we are wrapped with the robe of righteousness. Because step number five is also very, very important. It doesn't help. Let's let's take this example again, Fiona, like I said to you in the beginning. If you murder somebody and you come before the judge and you get forgiveness because the advocate goes into prison in your place, your advocate comes and take your penalty in your place and you go free. Will it be a clever thing to go and commit murder again? No. No, it will be stupid. You've just received forgiveness for your sin. Why will you go and continue to sin now? After you've been clothed with garments of salvation, you now need to learn to put on the robe of righteousness. The robe of righteousness is what the Bible calls the white linen of the bride. The beautiful white bridal wedding gown. Let me show you. Sorry, verse 8. Revelation 19, verse 8. It says, and to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. Ah, can you see how the Old Testament says, when we get forgiveness before God, we are wrapped, we are clothed with garments of salvation, but then we are also wrapped with a robe of righteousness and that robe that white clean linen that the bride puts on is the right our righteous acts we just saw fiona you said that it will be to do the right things before god once you get forgiveness for your sin the rest of your life you'll continue to do righteous things you will stop sinning who can who can tell me um who of you know the story of the prostitute that was brought before Yeshua? Who of you know what happened then? Because uh the the, the people brought uh, the prostitute before Jesus and they asked him that according to the law of Moses, anyone who commits adultery is supposed to be stoned to death. Mm. But uh, I, but Jesus told them that if any man among you has never seen, let him be the first person to cast a stone onto her. Mm -hmm. And they left. And they left. And then Jesus asked the lady, that woman, who are your accusers? Mm -hmm. the, lady said, the lady said that I've gone. And then Jesus told her that even me, I condemn you, no. Go mm -hmm. and, sin, and sin no more. Can you see now? Can you see? She came before the judge. She had accusers on the one side. And then there was no witnesses because remember he said to her, where are your accusers? Where's your witnesses? There was nobody with to witness against her. And then there was there was nobody to bring the condemnation against her. And then Yeshua said, I also, I do not, not condemn you. But the very important thing, step number five, was to then go and sin no more. Because once you've appeared before the judge and you get forgiveness of your sin, you have to now be wrapped in the robe of righteousness. You have to follow the right path and you have to go back to your life and sin no more. How, how do we learn what sin is? How, how, how can we know how to live? Who, who knows now that we get forgiveness, now that the judge has set us free and our handwriting of curses is blotted out, how do we continue to live? How, how do we find the way in which God wants us to live? Who knows? 
Let's go to Psalm. Let's go to the book of Psalms. Psalm 119. Tell me when you're there. Yeah. Verse 9. Yeah, uh, this is, a, this is a easier to read version. It, it says that, how can a young person live a pure life? And it says that by obeying your wife. Yeah. You see, once you stand before this judge and you know that you deserve death and actually get mercy and forgiveness, you now go back to your life. You are so thankful for forgiveness. For the second chance you have in life that you now get to know his word. This judge told you, don't sin again. Your advocate, he is carrying your sin in your place. And now he's telling you, go live the rest of your life and don't sin anymore. We know that we're going to make mistakes. We read in 1 John 1 verse 9 that Yeshua says we mustn't sin. But if we sin, we must confess our sins. We must stop doing it and we can get forgiveness before God. But the, the most important thing is to stop sinning. And how do we stop sinning? We have to understand what sin is. And therefore, we have to study the word of God. How do we keep our, um, our path clean? Psalm 119, by keeping it according to the word of God. Now we understand this whole legal court system of heaven better. And now if you um, come before the judge many times and you learn how repentance work and you get to know your advocate so well and you get to know the judge so well, there will come a time just like the priests of the Old Testament. They, they came before God um, many times for the people. They came representing the people before God many times. So as you start getting to know the court system better and your life is being cleansed and you become a servant of God, you can actually come back into this court system and you can come into um, the in before the judge for other people as well. And you can start pleading and confessing for other people as well, you can hear what the accuser is saying. Let's say you want to pray for your mother. You can hear all the sins and all the stuff that the accuser has against your mother. And then you go through these five steps. You admit your guilt, you repent, and not your guilt, your mother's guilt. You admit her guilt, you repent for her, you ask for mercy for your mother. And then you, you say thank you to God that there is mercy for your mother. And then you try and, and pray and ask your advocate to help you that your mother will stop sinning. It doesn't mean that you can stand in the place of your mother, but you can come and do the work of a priest in the court system for other people. Just like we saw Daniel did in Daniel 9. Me and Fiona, we read through the whole Daniel 9. I think we must end our discussion today by going back to Daniel 9 again. And maybe we can ask one of the guys if you can read for us Daniel 9, because Daniel 9 was one of these kinds of people that loved his nation. He loved his people and he came before God many times, standing in, repenting for other people. And we have to learn to get such a heart for other people as well. So I don't know, Paul or Chris, any of you guys read for us Daniel 9 from verse 3 to verse 11. Uh, the, the, uh, the Bible says, Then I turned to the Lord God. I prayed to him and asked him for help. I did not eat any food. I put ashes on my head and put on the clothes that showed I was sad. I prayed to the Lord my God and told him about my sins. I say, Lord, you are a great and awesome God. 
you keep your agreements of love. You keep your agreement of love and kindness with people who love you. You keep your agreement with the people who obey your commands. Yeah. But we have sinned. We have done wrong. We have done evil things. We turn against you. We turn away from your commands and good decisions. The prophets were your servants. They spoke for you to our kings, to our leaders, to our fathers, and to the common people in our, co in our country, mm. but did not listen to them. Lord, you are innocent, and the shame belongs to us, even shame now. Shame belongs to us, you see. Yeah. I continue? Yes, please. Sorry. Shame belongs to the people from Judah and Jerusalem and to all the people of Israel, to those who are near and to those you scattered among many nations. They should be ashamed of all the evil things they did against you. Lord, we should be ashamed. All our kings and leaders should be ashamed. Our ancestors should be ashamed because we sinned against you. But Lord our God, you are kind and forgiving. Even though we rebelled against you, we have not obeyed the Lord our God. He used his servants, the prophets, and gave us laws, but we have not obeyed his laws. All the people of Israel disobeyed your teachings and turned away from you. They did not listen to you. We sinned, so you did what you promised to do. All the curses and promises in the law of Moses, your servant, happened to us. You see how, how Daniel understands these five steps. Admitting guilt for himself, for his fathers, for his country, for his kings. He's even praying for the people that's close to him. And he's praying for the people that has been scattered all over the world. The people of God. And this is exactly what we must learn to do. First of all, we have to go through the court system for ourselves, then for our families, then for our church, then for our town, then for our country, and then for all the world. Because that is the, the heart of a servant of God. But the, the most important step is for ourselves to learn about the judge, the accuser, and the advocate. And then once we've gone through that system, we now return to the word of God to learn how to live so that we can put on the, the wedding garments and we can be invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb, being washed clean and being made pure by His blood. Amen. I'm finished. Thy kingdom come, thy will be. Thank you very Honor much. As it is. The pleasure, Fiona. Give us our Thank you. Hello, Audrey. I think a lot and who come, but uh, from now on, we'll be gathering every Sunday. South African time is uh, three o'clock, Uganda time is four o'clock. Okay. Forever. I'll remember. Thank you very much. Thanks, Audrey. Thank you so much. I, although I came, came in too late, but thank you so much. At least I've picked something. I know next time might be the first person to log in.